G'day, America. Welcome to the continuation of the program on what happens when a person dies. Now, I know, and you know, most people believe that the dead are not dead, but the dead are really alive. That's believed by just about all the Protestants, all the Catholics, and all the Jews. Is it taught in the Bible, or is it tradition? The Carter Report investigates the mysteries of the past as it seeks to interpret amazing predictions concerning our future. John Carter, scholar, writer, and traveler, invites you to join him as he unlocks mankind's most valuable treasure. Let me show you now from the very words of Jesus what he said about the dead. Come over here to page 1046, John 11, verse 1. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John 1046. John chapter 11. Please turn it up. Please turn it up. John chapter 11, verse 1. Here Jesus gives the clearest description of death in any literature in the world. John 11, and it's verse 1. Now a certain man was sick, Lazarus of Bethany, the town of Mary. Then it says, her sister Martha. And then it says, verse, verse 11. These things said he, this is Jesus, and after that he said to them, our friend Lazarus sleeps. He sleeps. People say, no, he can't be sleeping. He's in heaven or he's in hell. Our friend Lazarus sleeps, but I'm going to go there to wake him up. Then his disciples said, Lord, if he sleeps, he will get well. How be it, Jesus spoke of his death, but they thought that he was speaking about taking of rest and sleep. Then said Jesus unto them plainly, Lazarus is dead. Jesus said, can I write this up on the blackboard? The, I mean, friend, if you don't want to believe me, that's all right, but don't turn away from the words of Jesus, I'm telling you. Don't reject what I'm saying tonight because of preconceived ideas. Jesus said, here's point number six, Jesus said, the dead, the very words of Jesus, Jesus said, the dead are sleeping. I know we couldn't fit that all in, but you get the gist of it. Jesus said, Lazarus is sleeping. Jesus said, Lazarus is dead. My friend, if a person were in hell, he could hardly be sleeping. Jesus said, he is sleeping. I'm going to go there and wake him up. There was a little boy who'd lost his daddy. And they were wondering how they could explain death to this little boy. And a preacher who understood what we're talking about tonight came in and sat down with that little boy and he said, you know, Billy, how it is after you've run around all day and you're absolutely exhausted. Sometimes you're so tired that you just fall asleep. And we come in and mom and dad would pick you up and put you into bed, and you would know not a thing. You would not know a thing. You would not be conscious of the passing of time. You fall asleep, and in the next moment, as far as you're concerned, the sun is streaming through the windows, and mother is calling and saying, Billy, get up. Billy, get up. That's what death is like. My friend, there is no consciousness of the passing of time. That is why Paul said he wanted to depart and be with Christ. That is why Paul said, I've got a great desire to be with Christ and to be with my Lord. Because when a person dies, time ceases. It doesn't exist. That person is then in eternity and he sleeps until Jesus says, the sun is shining, it is time for you to get up. You see? I want to tell you folks something. I'm not afraid of death because Jesus conquered death and he whipped it. 
Jesus whipped it. And Jesus went through what you and I have to go through. Jesus went down into the tomb and he slept and he slept until his father said on the third day, it is time for you to get up. And Jesus walked out of the tomb. Jesus whipped death. That's why I'm not afraid of death. Because one day, I am going to live again, you see. Did you know this, that the Bible teaches that all of the saints, like the Blessed Virgin Mary and Peter and James and John and all the apostles are sleeping in the grave awaiting the resurrection. That's why the Bible says the church is built upon Christ. My friend, the church, when it says, when the Catholic Church it is built up, says it is built upon St. Peter, has given the game away. Because if it is built upon St. Peter, it is built upon a dead man who cannot save. A man who was sleeping like the rest of the saints, awaiting the resurrection. But the Bible says the true church is built upon the living Christ. You see, that's the difference between the true church and the false church. Come over here to page 1038. 1038 to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Verse 3. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 3. The Bible says, 1 Corinthians 15 verse 3. Notice it in the Scriptures. For I delivered to you first of all that which I received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that He was buried, that He rose again the third day according to the Scriptures, and that He was seen by Cephas, Peter, then by the twelve. After that He was seen by over 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remained to the present, but some have fallen asleep. He said some of the apostles, some of the saints had fallen asleep. Did you hear that? Later on, they all fell asleep. That is why my Catholic, my Protestant friend, it's no good praying to Mary. It is no good praying to Peter because they are sleeping. But Jesus Christ, my friend, is wide awake. You see, the saints can't help. That is why the Bible says there is one God, one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. Jesus alone can save. You see, that's what the Bible says. Now, what I'm going to do now is this. I'm going to answer two objections that people have to this Bible teaching. The first one is found on page 657 about the Spirit going back to God. Ecclesiastes 12, 7, page 657. Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, chapter 12, verse 7. Ecclesiastes chapter 12 and verse 7. We are going to pull all the strings together and now answer any worry that you've got in your mind. Ecclesiastes, can you see this so far? Can you see this, dear people? Ecclesiastes 12, verse 7. You got this? Notice how this man talks about death. He says, Then the dust will return to the earth as it was, and the Spirit will return to God who gave it. Now somebody says, this proves the point. The soul goes back to God. It didn't say that. It didn't say that. It said, the Spirit goes back to God. When a person dies, the body Goes to dust, the Bible says. The Spirit goes back to God. What is the Spirit? That is the question that we have to settle now. Come to page 524. Job 27, verse 3. Job 27 and verse 3. And here is a good definition of what the, of the Spirit is that goes back to God. Job 27, verse 3. Book of Job, chapter 27, dear friend. And it's verse 3, it makes it ever so plain. It says, as long as my breath is in me, and the breath of God is in my nostrils. Listen to me. This word breath in the Hebrew and in the Greek 
and in the King James Version, any translation, that word is the same word as spirit. Now, let me come over here to the blackboard. The Bible says that when a person dies, exactly the opposite happens to when God made the first man. You notice what happened here? Dust plus breath made a living soul. Here you have a living soul. And the Bible says the spirit will go back to God. The spirit or the breath of life. That is the breath, that is the, the vital spark of life that God has put within us. We don't understand that. That goes back to God and the body goes back to dust. And the person, my friend, sleeps in the grave, oblivious to the passing of time. And when he wakes up in the resurrection, he will say, I have been asleep for half a second. You see? It is the vital life force that goes back to God. This vital force that God has put within me that has made me into a living soul, you say. Now, listen, listen, listen. In somebody's mind is thumping the text that says, didn't Jesus say to the dying thief that he would be with him that very day in paradise? And you say, I can see all of the texts tonight and it seems logical, it seems biblical, it seems clear, but here is one that has me thrown. Not for long it won't. Come over here to Luke 23. Page 1028, 1028, please turn it up, 1028, uh, Luke 23, verse 29, Matthew, Mark, Luke, Luke, we'll turn up the text together, and then we'll read this text, starting at verse 39, verse 39, Luke 23, verse 39. You've got this verse. You see it there? Verse 39. Then one of the criminals who were hanged blasphemed him, saying, If you are the Christ, save yourself and us. But the others answering rebuked him, saying, Do you not even fear God, seeing you are under the same condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds, but this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said to Jesus, beautiful, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said unto him, comma, assuredly, I say to you, comma, Today you will be with me in paradise. From that text, it would appear, my friend, that the Bible contradicts itself. It would appear that Jesus was contradicting himself. But listen to me. Listen. In the original language, in the original Greek in which this text was given, there are no punctuation marks. Did you hear that? There is not one single punctuation mark. All the punctuation marks are supplied by the translators, good men who believed in the immortality of the soul. Now, I am going to show you a text. Don't lose this place. Put your finger there. Come to page 1058. John 20, verse 17. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John 20, verse 17. John chapter 20, verse 17. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John chapter 20, verse 17. Here is a text that apparently contradicts that text. But when, my friend, we harmonize it, there'll be no contradiction because the Bible is a harmony. John 20, verse 17. Jesus said to her. This is to Mary on the Sunday morning of her resurrection of his resurrection. 
This is the Sunday morning. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him, Rabboni, which is to say, teacher or master. Jesus said to her, Do not cling to me, Mary, for I have not yet ascended to my Father. Did you hear this? Jesus said, I haven't gone to my Father yet. That's what Jesus said. I haven't ascended to my Father. But go to my brethren and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and to your Father and to my God and to your God. Jesus said on that Sunday morning, I haven't gone to paradise yet, but I'm going now. Now come back to Luke. Jesus said categorically on the Sunday, he had not gone to paradise. Jesus said he had not gone home to his father's house. Then if this is so, how on earth could Jesus have gone on Friday if he said, I haven't gone yet on Sunday? The truth of the matter is he hadn't gone. Look at this text. John 20, Luke, Luke 23, verse 43, Luke 23, 43. And Jesus said to him, assuredly, I say to you, I say to you today, you will be with me in paradise. Listen, listen carefully. The commas are supplied they are not in the original. Change the comma and you make that text fit in with all the rest of the Bible. Remember, the commas were put there by good men who believed in the Catholic doctrine of the immortality of the soul. This, of course, is an Anglican Bible. Certainly not a Baptist Bible or an Adventist or a Pentecostal Bible. This is an Anglican Bible, the King James Version. Now, look at verse 43. And Jesus said to him, Assuredly I say to you today, comma, you will be with me in paradise. Does that make any difference? Now listen. On one occasion, the Tsar of Russia said that a man was to be sent to Siberia. He'd been doing something the Tsar obviously didn't like. And in those days, it didn't have to be much. So the Tsar said, this man is to go to Siberia. But the wife of this noble lord went to the Tsar's wife and pled for her husband. But the Tsar was adamant, and he wrote down, pardon impossible, full stop. Pardon impossible, to be sent to Siberia, pardon impossible. You don't call it a full stop, do you? What do you call it? Period. All right, here we go again. Pardon impossible, period. <laughs> to be sent to Siberia. Okay. That's what he said. But the Tsar's wife came in and took an eraser. And she rubbed out the period. And she put the period after pardon. And so it read, pardon, period, full stop. Impossible to be sent to Siberia. Does it make any difference? Jesus said, there is Jesus, my friend, hanging on the old rugged cross. And this man calls upon Jesus in the 11th hour. He is the dying thief, and he calls Jesus Lord. And he says, Lord, remember me. Lord, remember me. And Jesus says, I say to you today, as I hang here on this cross, I say to you today, you will be with me in paradise. And he will be when Jesus comes the second time and sets up his kingdom. You see? Now, my dear friends, my dear friends, 
Listen to this. Do you know why they came and broke the legs of the thieves? You know why they came to break Jesus' legs? Because the Sabbath was coming on and they didn't want those men, if they were taken down from the cross on the Sabbath, they didn't want those men to get up and crawl away and run away because it took sometimes a week for a man to die on the cross, seven days or more. And so they came and broke their legs, most likely, almost assuredly. Those dying thieves did not die that day. And that is why they broke their legs. Most likely they put them up on the cross again on Saturday night. Jesus died because he died of a broken heart. Men could survive the cross for up to ten days. It was hell on earth. Jesus didn't go to paradise that day. He slept in the tomb. The thief didn't go to paradise that day. Most likely he was put back again on Saturday night. But one thing is sure. That th thief, because of the grace of God, will be with Jesus in paradise. The question is, what about you? What about you? I want to tell you something else. When you understand this truth, it blows away the cobwebs of doubt and discouragement. It robs the tomb of its victory. And what is more, my friend, I want to tell you folks something. You listen to me. Unless you understand this truth, you are a sitting duck as far as the last great occult deception is concerned. I'm going to talk about that tonight and I'm going to tell you why we better get straight on this because if we don't we are going to be deceived by the Antichrist because the Bible says Antichrist is going to do great miracles based on the doctrine of the immortality of the soul, his first lie. That's what I talk about tomorrow night. I want to talk now and tell you the story of Sammy Tannehill. He too was a dying thief. Sammy was more than a thief. Sammy was a murderer. And Sammy had been sentenced to die in the electric chair. Somehow, Sammy heard a religious broadcast and Sammy sent for a correspondence course and got a Bible. And as Sammy started to read the Bible, something wonderful started to happen inside Sammy's heart. He thought to himself, maybe there is a God, and maybe I ought to pray to this God. And so Sammy got down for the first time in his life, and he got down beside his bed, and he prayed, dear God, please send me a gun, and help me to shoot my way out of this jail, and then I'll go straight. That was a good start for a prayer. At least he was praying. But God doesn't always answer our prayers as we think he ought. And Sammy had no peace. And death was approaching for Sammy because he was sentenced to die in the electric chair. Sammy didn't know what to do. And for four days and four nights he could not sleep. And in the end Sammy got down beside his bed and he prayed, Dear God, forgive me every sin that exists because I know that I am guilty of them all. And then he got into bed and for the first time in years he slept like a baby. He had a clear conscience. A minister came along to see him by the name of Pastor Fagel. And they talked, and Sammy, by the study of the Scriptures, gave his life to Jesus. And now the moment had come for Sammy to die in the electric chair. And Pastor Fagel came in and talked to Sammy, and Sammy prayed this prayer. I've written it down here. This was the day he was to die. He prayed this prayer. Lord, you know that one year ago I placed my life in your hands, you know that nothing that has happened in this past year has changed that fact. Nothing that will happen tonight will change it either. 
My life is still in your hands. Do with it as you see best. And God, I know that you never make any mistakes. And then Pastor Fagel prayed a prayer for Sammy. And then Sammy, before they went into the place where they had the electric chair, Sammy broke out again in this prayer which was recorded. Dear God, do not hold these men responsible for what they are, are about to do with me. Remember God, it is what I did that makes it necessary for them to take my life. If their act is a sin, Lord, charge it up to my account and then forgive it as you've forgiven every one of my sins. Pastor Fagel and Sammy went into the place where there were 12 ashen witnesses and the guards and Sammy was strapped into the polished wood electric chair and Pastor Fager was allowed, allowed to stand at a distance from him and together they repeated the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses. And then the current was turned on and Sammy convulsed. And Sammy's spirit, the breath of life, went back to God. And Sammy fell asleep. And the next thing Sammy knows is going to be the voice of Jesus saying, Sammy, wake up. Sammy, come forth. And Sammy, my friend, is going to walk out of his tomb. And Sammy, the thief, is going to be with that other thief in paradise. And I say, thank God, hallelujah. Don't you? Sammy's going to make it. Sammy is going to be there. You know why? Because he called upon Jesus Christ. That's why. I want to say to you tonight, friend, what about you? Are you going to be there? Are you going to be there with Jesus in paradise? When Jesus calls your name, are you going to say, Lord, I'm coming.